listening to Affect Autism, where Affect is the number one tool we use in supporting child development through playful interactions. Welcome back. This is Daria Brown, and this week I have with me occupational therapist Alicia Payaro, who is the assistant director of Little Buddies Pediatric Therapy, a DIR occupational therapy practice just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia, where she is lovingly known as the queen of poop. <laughs> she has her DIR, Developmental Individual Difference Relationship-Based Proficient Certificate from ICDL. She is a play project consultant, has training in sensory integration and the relationship between trauma and sensory regulation. Her boss is Keith Landhair, whom we podcasted with a few weeks ago. Today, we are talking about toileting and interoception, which is an area she has quite a bit of experience with. Welcome, Alicia. It's so nice to have another Canadian again. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Daria. Happy to be here. Awesome. So, you know, this is a podcast I've wanted to do for so long because what parent doesn't ask about toileting issues when their, child, when their child's on the spectrum? Um, I don't think I've known anyone with an autistic child who hasn't had some kind of struggles around toileting. And uh, I guess I would, I, we might get into this later, but as an experienced floor timer now years later, when I look at it, I think, well, is it, is it the child's issue or is it the parent's issue? And maybe we can get into that later. Um, but let's come, let's start with the common experiences that families come to you about, since you're an occupational therapist, uh, what are the problems that they're bringing to you that they, they want solved? And what kind of categories, I guess, uh, do you see them fall into? And then we'll, we'll sort of talk about how you, how you delve into these, uh, what kind of suggestions you do, what kind of work you do with the child or parent? Yeah, right. I guess I'm, I'm kind of already smiling and giggling about it with what you've already kind of touched on because it is something that we all do every single day, right? It's at the forefront of parents' minds for every child. And just what you've said, right? All parents of autistic children have had some kind of toileting journey. Um, and yet I don't actually think we talk about it all that much, truly. Um, it's often, right? We have a fair bit of, I don't know, poop and that kind of stuff happens behind closed doors. And we might talk about it in a tongue in cheek kind of way if we talk about it at all. Um, you know, but very rarely am I doing kind of an initial conversation, just getting to know a family um, that I'm going to get kind of the lowdown on what's going on in the bathroom, even if that is a huge part of their day, right? A huge part of their child's day um, in often a really stressful kind of way. Um, you know, but I really do find a lot of parents aren't entirely sure who to talk to about this, aren't entirely sure where to go um, for support and kind of feel like it's, well, I guess, I guess we'll just get there. Maybe we'll just get there and one day it's just going to happen. Um, you know, and in a lot of ways, I, you know, in some ways I do really agree with that because, you know, just like many, many, many of our approaches, we want to follow the child's lead. They really are going to let us know if we're watching really carefully when they're ready to embark on this toileting journey. Right. It might not be on our schedule. It's usually not on our schedule, but I've, you know, I've really never met a child that doesn't let us know when they're ready and they're interested if we pay attention to that. But I just, I just don't find it something to be talked about. And I think as I've, you know, kind of gone down this, this rabbit hole with toileting truthfully, it's, it's really challenged me to confront kind of my own shame about it really? Um, you know, and as you said, I'm sorry if I'm getting ahead of the conversation, it's, we thought we'd circle back here, but I think it's a really important place for us to start because, um, you know, as parents and caregivers, when it comes to toileting, there is so much for us to do in terms of modeling and supporting and co-regulating with children while they're going through this process of learning to void from their bodies. Um, and I think most of us have a really actually complicated kind of complex relationship with going to the bathroom, depending on our own personal histories. And it does relate to our own individual differences 
Is it something we're really uncomfortable with? Is it something we absolutely never talk about? Um, or did we grow up in a house where fluids were flying here, there, and everywhere, and it's just as common as asking somebody to go out for dinner? Um, hey, do you want to come to the bathroom with me and have a chat? It's really, really, really different for everybody. And um, it's truly kind of a great starting spot for us to kind of do some of that check-in. And I love getting to know, um, kind of in building this space of comfort for parents to be able to have that, that kind of just that breathing space to say, okay, right, we can talk about this. You're, you're not actually grossed out, Alicia, when I tell you about this thing that they're doing. Um, you know what, no, I'm, I, I'm really not. Yeah, poop smells. No, it's not something I ever want to play with. I feel you. Absolutely not. Um, but it's certainly a part of everyday life. And so it's important that we talk about it in that kind of way. Um, and I love to invite parents into that conversation. We need to kind of get through that space first. And that's a lot of the work that we do, um, that I do practicing as an OT informed from DIR, um, right? Is getting to know kind of our own individual histories and our relationships with our bodies. Um, making sense of what we feel inside of our bodies is just as important as making sense of our extensory experience that are coming towards our bodies from the environment. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, it. go ahead. E even cultural differences, I can imagine. Um, <clears throat> in some cultures, it might be shameful to talk about it. Uh, in like you mentioned, differences in households. Some people go to the bathroom with the doors open and it's totally fine. Others, they must have the door locked and don't even think about um, coming near. Um, you know, do people make jokes when someone, you know, the, the joke of, oh, oh, uncle or grandpa or dad was in the bathroom, Ugh, don't go in there. You know, there's jokes yeah. in movies about it smelling and do people joke about it? Or are people shameful and hiding and don't want people to know? Like, there's so many things that you just brought up there that, that I hadn't even thought about in terms of <laughs> getting into the podcast, but that is the background and the setting for this. You're right. Like it, that's, um, that's the lens that the parents are coming in with. And then they have certain expectations around their, their child. And if their child is smearing poop on the walls or sm smearing it on their face or eating it yeah. or, or, um, you know, wetting the bed when they're older or pooping in the bed, um, all of these different things, it can bring up so many different feelings uh, for parents. Absolutely, absolutely. Not, not to mention the feelings that their reactions cause the children to have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's this, I think this is kind of meaning making. Right. And when I think about toileting and kind of this ultimate goal of being able to, you know, support children to have kind of a comfortable, safe relationship with their body so that these sensations that tell them, oh, it's time to go, isn't scary, isn't stressful, doesn't provoke feelings of shame. It's just, OK, right. I got to go um, and, and I go in the toilet and I and I really understand. And it's meaningful for me as a child to want to go into the toilet. Um, and, you know, that's that kind of missing piece that I find a lot of kind of the common behavior based approaches, which is seems to be kind of the gold standard when it comes to toileting, um, kind of miss out on a little bit is that meaning piece again, right? Why do we want to go to the bathroom in the toilet? Where does that come from? Um, you know, speaking from us as adults, there's, there's a lot there. Right. Ultimately, I think it's because of hygiene in a lot of ways. Um, I don't want poop all over the house in every corner because it'd be god awful and smelly. What a mess. There'd be illnesses. Right. We can go on and on and on. Um, but that's all learned, isn't it? It's learned that we go into a bathroom and we do that in a private space. And, and part of that is for personal safety, that we don't want to expose our naked bodies in a public space. And so we go into these private spaces. Um, and kind of as I'm going through these different areas, it's a lot of really kind of higher level social thinking and kind of social consequences and meaning around why do we toilet in the way that we do, right? Um, and I guess what's interesting about that and a piece that is sometimes missing for families that come to me, you know, and so one of these kind of common, common profiles that I see, if I could call it a profile, um, you know, are children that are kind of comfortable going here, there, and everywhere, 
I'll go in my pants. I'm, I'm still probably quite dependent on diapers. Um, you know, I'm happy going in the car ride or while I'm riding a swing or while I'm singing, kind of just comfy to go. Around other people, around, around family, people. around friends, around strangers, in a you restaurant. <laughs> yep. Yep. Sitting at the table. <laughs> Uh huh. Um, and they're the kids that are seemingly kind of unaware that they've gone sometimes, right? So they're kind of comfortable just going, voiding their bladder or their bowels, and it's it's comfortable to sit in for them, or at least it's seemingly comfortable, right? Um, you know, and so sometimes I hear the kind of phrase, "Well, they're just they're lacking awareness, right? They just um, they're not aware of what's happening. Um, they're not aware of what's happening inside of their bodies, um, you know, and so we're dependent on diapers, but they're getting older and I sure would love to move past diapers. Things are getting messier and messier and bigger, quite frankly, to clean up, right? Um, you know, and in that say, case, when I'm, we're trying to kind of tease this apart, kind of want to ask that question, is that child truly unaware? And what does that mean? Unaware of what? Um, because I would disagree with that piece, um, you know, but I, I would say that they're that child, that they're just, they're comfortable going there. Um, and that is that intrinsically motivated act for them. For me, it makes sense to just go. And it also just makes sense to me to not let you know that my diaper needs to be changed. I'm fine with this. The smell doesn't bug me. I might not actually even register that it's wet, right? Different sensations. And so, a lot of our job is around kind of going back to those basics and building that awareness and understanding in a way that's meaningful for that child. Um, you know, and how do we do that though, is it really, that's kind of the big, big, big question there. Um, and like many, many things, play is the name, right? We go to play um, and we wanna bring it to the forefront so that there is an opportunity to kind of amplify awareness, just like we would with other sensory experiences, right? You said beforehand, I'm, maybe the children that aren't noticing, they're bumping into all of these different things. How do we, how do we bring awareness to that? And maybe it's just a, oh, well, you know what? I've seen lots of kids bump into those things when you're, when they're their age, right? I know it's just that you're so excited to get to the other side of the room. Um, and if there's something really important that I don't want that child to hit on accident, I might jump in front of them and say, whoa, careful, this is my most favorite base in the whole world, right? To amplify that awareness piece and give that child the information that they need to pivot, to change course. How do we do that with poop, though? We want to get rid of it as quick as we can possibly get rid of it. Right. Um, and that speed that I think a lot of us go in as adults and caregivers, um, unfortunately, sends a little bit of a message that this is not something that we should pay much attention to. We should just get rid of it kind of as quickly as we can. Um, I don't want to look at it for very long. I don't want it on my hands. I want to get in and get out. And, and that makes sense. I, I want to, too. Um, but unfortunately there, we might not necessarily be supporting that child's learning um, in all the ways that we could, right? So how do we choose our moments to kind of amplify things? And it's as, it can be as subtle as just making sure that if you're changing that child's diaper, to make sure that you take that diaper and you lift it up and have a chance for the child to see what is in there, right? Have a chance for them to register that noxious smell the reason it smells really bad. Um, we want to get rid of it, but I do need to present it. So that chance is there. So as a parent, I'm thinking, ew, why yeah. would I want to show that to my child? Because then my child's going to stick his hand in it. Right. Right. <laughs> That's yeah. the first thing that comes to my mind. I, I'm guessing other parents out there are thinking the same thing. Yeah. So how do you handle that question? I'd probably let him put his hand in it, truthfully. <laughs> okay. Yes, I know. I know. I was hoping um, that wasn't what you're going to say, but okay. <laughs> no, and I, you know, we're not, it's not coming from a place if I want to encourage play with poop. Absolutely right. not. Absolutely <clears throat> not. Yes. Um, but if a child is reaching out to touch it, that's a gesture of curiosity. What is this? Right? Um, and so do I want them reaching out and playing with that poop all the time? No way, 
no way. Um, but to give them that learning experience, right? If they want to reach out and touch it and bring it close to their face and suddenly they're like, whoa, that's gross. That does not smell good. And suddenly they reach their hand back to you and get rid of this. Ugh, clean my hand. Um, that is a brilliant learning experience for that child to help build that connection. I've got this stuff that came off from my underwear and my diaper. Um, and it's kind of gross. It really is kind of gross. And it might take touching it, bringing it close to their face to smell it, to feel it, to really get that sense versus just having kind of a quick glance at something. I just noticed there's a different color there and it's swept away before I get to determine is this yuck or not, right? Um, so a, yeah. couple, a couple of questions. Oh, are you doing that? Yes. Are you doing that just once? Are you doing it a few times? And the second question, what if your kid doesn't go gross and tries to eat it and seems to like the feeling of smearing it on their face or something like that? <laughs> right, right. Which is, right, fairly common, truthfully. Um, right, that smearing in that play, it can be an amazing paint, unfortunately, the grossest paint I've ever seen. Um, I guess I want to think about kind of what is our what can be our reaction and our guide in that moment? And our children are looking to us to make sense of that moment, right? And that social reciprocity piece. So in that moment, ideally, we've gone into this toilet space knowing, okay, this could get messy. Um, can we check in with ourselves? Am I feeling regulated right now? Am I feeling like I can go in and handle the inevitable gross, the inevitable mess without feeling a bit anxious myself without getting too frustrated myself? Do I feel equipped for that? And if so, okay, cool. Maybe I'm going to go in there and take this slow today. Um, and that allows me to set up to be regulatory and co-regulate with that child in that moment, right? Um, and I want to focus on kind of building, getting these circles of communication happening with my child before the diaper even comes off. So we're building that connection, that child's awareness. We're starting to get into even some problem solving and awareness building, right? When I pull my pants down and there's something there, where did that come from? Now I'm problem solving and trying to make sense of where that came from. Maybe I'll cue the child to look behind their back to make sense if it is actually from my body, right? Um, or to look into a mirror. Well, that's where that stuff came from. And that might be all I need to do in that moment because I notice that my child's, right, their attention is kind of fleeting in that moment. Um, and maybe being in the bathroom is something that they can only be and experience as a regulated being for several moments before it feels too much from a kind of a sensory overwhelm perspective. And that's when I might say, I'm going to call this quits. So that was our first kind of learning endeavor. We've done a little bit of meeting making, and now I'm going to swoop in, clean it up quickly and get rid of it because that's all we need to do for today. But we can kind of build on that slowly, slowly, slowly. And with that routine, and we model that moment of calm. This is just something that I play with, um, right? But if that child touches that poop or brings it towards their face, what response we give is going to be really important. Um, and that moment of, oh, 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 yuck, right? And kind of doing that exaggerated affect that us floor timers know so well is going to be really, really important in this moment. Um, exaggerated, but I will say honest, because we don't, we want to be really careful for the kids that do, don't find it noxious, do find it kind of fun to play with, that we're not adding humor to encourage that play. I was just going to say, I can, I can hear some of the parents from my um, ICDL's parent drop in saying, Oh, my son would love that because then they would do it on purpose. So to see me go, ew, yuck, yuck. And they'd think that's hilarious. Right. Um, and, right. and, you know, kids being in the stage of, they love saying, oh, fart, 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 ha, 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 you know, in front of yeah. everybody, grandma and everybody embarrassing, uh, the parents are embarrassed because their kids are talking about farts and poop. There's a stage <laughs> that, that kids go through where they do that. So what if they're doing the same kind of thing when you're going yuck and they're, they're thinking, oh, cool, I'm going to do the opposite. <laughs> right. And that's why I put in that word kind of this honest response to it. So when I see poop, I, I don't feel excited about it and want to make a joke about it, right? That, oh, yuck, oh, oh, oh. It's kind of playful and silly. 
that's not quite the right message there. That's not quite the right affective intent that I want to amplify, right? If we're trying to amplify gross, right? There's subtle twists, I think, even in like the tone of our voice. Do we go up higher, which often indicates kind of playfulness? Ew! With a big smile and we start laughing, that invites play. But if we see that and instead we even just drop our tone of voice, ew, ugh, right? And my tone of voice drops and I just take it and I immediately cover it up, ugh, and I put it in the garbage can. Um, I'm still trying to amplify and kind of clarify for the child what my affective kind of message or intent is in that moment, right? I'm using high affect, but I'm not using playful necessarily because we're not playing with the poo. That's not the point here. Does that yeah. clarify those pieces? And that's tricky. This is, it's really tricky. I want to say that. Um, and it's quite, it's quite the dance um, to try to make a to play with that a little bit to find what is going to be that way that I can kind of tap into a communication style that my child is resonating with um, in which kind of the the meaning behind that message is actually conveyed for what I want it to be um, and it's very easy to go into the high affect means super high super playful super fun um, and not necessarily that might not be the go-to here so I, I'm thinking now of <clears throat> all of the things we wouldn't do. So I hear uh, I hear parents say, I, I worked with a behavioral person or did apply behavioral analysis ABA uh, for toilet training. And it's sort of like um, skills teaching. And, you know, there'll be the social story with the pictures. First you do this, then you do this, then you do this. Yay, you get a reward kind of thing. Uh, so there's that question. What would be, what would you see be some of the issues with that, developmentally speaking, um, mostly? And then secondly, the parent who is very naturally behavioral and says, no, don't touch that. Yuck. Do not do that. And maybe is anger or, you know, complete shock. <gasps> oh, get in the bathroom right now and sort of startles the child because you know they get frustrated with the child pooping in their pants you're you're seven years old you shouldn't be doing that kind of thing yeah. um and and maybe those parents don't have the patience or tolerance to do that co-regulatory piece like you said check in with yourself am i regulated am i feeling okay <clears throat> what kind of advice would you give to those scenarios <laughs> call in the troops <laughs> Don't feel like this needs to be something that, right, that parents need to do by themselves. Um, I'm not by any means disillusioned to think that the weekly trip to the OT um, is going to take off that burden for the mom or the dad that is in the bathroom every single day, multiple times a day. Um, but calling in some support so that it doesn't feel like it needs to be just on you is going to be important. Um, He's kind of circling back, you know, we brought up social stories and kind of this, you know, lots of positive rewards and, you know, in my approach and kind of what we, what we practice and kind of anecdotally has worked really well, you know, I, I'm not opposed to having a really meaningful, positive consequence, a natural consequence for the child if they do successfully get the poo in the toilet. That's cause for celebration. Right. Um, and we don't want to skip that piece. Um, but I think what's really, really important there that kind of differentiates kind of some of the externally motivated kind of rewards that would be kind of those the tangibles. Well, if you do this, then right now I'm going to immediately give you your favorite colored M&M or I'll immediately give you your tablet in that moment um, is does that link for that child in a way that celebrates who they are and what they just accomplished in that moment you know but I guess I'm kind of I wonder from you even when you were going through toilet training with your son kind of what was your moment of celebration that was meaningful for him and that's kind of that question and this can be really really changing um, you know and dependent upon that child's relationship 
with the caregiver that they're with in that moment. Um, and so that does get a little bit confusing and kind of, you know, I, I recognize that that's a challenging piece because I, I don't feel like I can advocate for saying you're going to need to find that one magic ticket that's going to be motivating for this child. And we can make sure that all the caregivers at school and in the community and the babysitter can all make sure that they're giving this one magic reward that's infinitely motivating. That magic wand doesn't exist, right? Um, but when we are building these relationships with our children, um, we all kind of build our own language of celebration in a way that feels really good for us. And so, you know, the way that, you know, that I might as an OT celebrate with a child might look and probably will and maybe even should look kind of different than the way that mom or dad or grandma celebrates with that child, because we all celebrate differently right? Um, we do a lot of dance and big play at our clinic and really, really active. So, you know, commonly with me, if there's a moment of success and kids come out, we stage a big dance party for the kids that enjoy that. That makes sense in our space and is something that's super enjoyable for that child. You know, I know that that doesn't necessarily make sense. It might not be what grandma wants to do in the restaurant, um, but maybe grandma and little one have a really, really close relationship and grandma's comforting touch is something that is so warm and comfortable and meaningful for that child that that big warm hug with a little giggle with grandma can be just as meaningful and just as rewarding for that child as that big dance party can be. Um, so, I, you know, I... Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're you're making me um, try and remember <laughs> my experience with it, and <clears throat> um, you. So we've talked about just one category so far. If we call it category, kids who will go anywhere, and you're going to talk about the kids who are extremely distressed about going anywhere, the ones who will hide mm -hmm. and don't want to, um, and and different other timing difficulties. But I will say uh, a couple of things that I want to put out there is that. A, it's not just autistic kids that go through different things like this, because I have a friend who remembered his little sister uh, being quiet and the parents were wondering why, you know, and he was little at the time and his younger sister was a baby and they were like, why is she so quiet? And he remembered walking in the room and seeing poo everywhere. And this oh, is a yes. very, very neurotypical woman now. Um, but when yeah. she was a baby, she discovered a poopy diaper and started playing with it. So this is not something that's just uh, unique to autistic children. This is a normal stage of development. It might be that some of our kids go through mm -hmm. that stage later than <clears throat> neurotypical babies may have. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and it doesn't mean that all kids go through this stage. My son never did. Um, I would say my my own son's development was was very uh very much similar to a neurotypical experience that was just delayed so he <clears throat> was out of diapers i think when he was age seven which is quite late when you think about neurotypical kids um he wasn't out of diapers until he was about age seven so you know this is when the extra large was way too small on him and the yeah. pull-ups were like squeezing and cutting off his circulation because, you know, he was bigger yeah. already and he's not a huge kid. Um, so um, I'm trying to remember, um, and, and of course, you know, first it's peeing and then you tackle the poop later and then you still have bedwetting. I think he still wet his bed till he was about nine. Yeah. Um, and then it got less frequent and it's been a long time now he's he's almost 13 i don't even remember when the last time he wet, wet the bed was so parents it does improve <laughs> but um i will say that what i remember doing and even to this day i'll say oh oh that felt so good to get your poopies out oh your tummy feels so much better now i'm so glad you got your poopies out now we can go to sleep because my son tends to be very um, what's the word, uh, regular, <laughs> it's always at night before bed, almost yeah. always like there's variation, but almost always at night before bed is when he poops. And so, you know, you'll hear all, you know, he'll get a little bit 
discomforted, you know, might be a little cranky. And I think it's because it's bedtime. And then he goes, poop, and he runs to the bathroom. And, and then be like, oh, that felt so good to get that out. So I think that's what you mean by more of a natural reward, as opposed to yes. if you go poop in the toilet, you can get this toy or you can listen, watch the iPad, like you had said, which yeah. is more reward based, externally based. We want our children to be intrinsically motivated and yeah. tune into what's going on in themselves, not be performing something that's out of their control for somebody else. Um, yes. And <clears throat> that that is very disturbing to me, but I, I know that it's worked for some parents, so I never want to say to parents not to do something that worked for them. Um, but just to be aware of that developmental piece. Yeah, that example that you just gave was just beautiful. It's a different way to use, right? That kind of high affect. Oh, that felt so good to get that out. Oh, didn't it? And you're drawing that connection to that internal body sensation, right? Which is building kind of awareness of regulation and how that feels, which is is really kind of a different way of thinking about a natural reward for the body, right? We want to feel calm and regulated. And ultimately, you know, that's, that's why we poop. The more that we, or pee, right? When our, when our body gets full, um, that's one of the kind of internal signals that tips us out of homeostasis. Just like if we don't get enough sleep or if we're getting too hungry or thirsty, um, we do naturally start to become a little bit dysregulated because that's the body's kind of way of saying, hey, something is going on that we should pay attention to right now. Um, and so the body, right, it's an incredibly powerful communicator with us, incredibly powerful. Um, you know, but unfortunately, it, it can become quite a chaotic communicator and quite a confusing communicator because these signals um, that kind of are intended to say, hey, you might need to go to the bathroom, um, internally might feel the same as the sensation that we get when we're running super, super fast or we go down a slide and there's suddenly that little bit of internal body discomfort where our tummy drops out from under us, whoop, something just happened. Ah, that little bit of a scare. And, and I haven't quite made meaning of what that sensation is that yet. Um, sometimes there's a bit of pain involved, right? If that pressure is built up so much in our bladder or our bowels, it, it is almost kind of a painful, noxious stimulus for a moment. And that can be really distressing and quite confusing, right? Why is, why is my body suddenly hurting when I can't see or perceive anything from my external world that would tell me there was a, there's something dangerous here, right? Um, and, uh, and so many of uh, children on the spectrum have gastrointestinal issues um, and you know, digestive issues. So that's going to add to that painful sensory experience as well. And, and I know that, um, <clears throat> I think I've mentioned this before on the podcast that I'll get reports from the school sometime that, you know, my son will, will suddenly get a little bit aggressive and dysregulated. And within a half an hour, he has a bowel movement. And, you know, he didn't necessarily know that that's why he's feeling aggressive until the moment where it's ready to come out and then he knows to go to the bathroom. So it can yes. be very dysregulating for our children too and, and uncomfortable, just like it is for us. Absolutely. We ate something bad that didn't sit well with us, you know, stomach pains and yeah. Yep. Yeah. Kind of the, you know, we can think about in that kind of kind of curve or growth, right? And that um, the stronger that our body's needs become, right? So the more tired I get, the more hungry I get, more and more and more, as that upticks, the fuller my bladder becomes, the more dysregulated my body becomes. Because, right, more and more of my body's capacities need to be focused on that. Mm -hmm. How do I keep that inside my body right now if I don't want to void my bladder right in this moment? Um, and, and so it's important for us to do that kind of check-in. And remember, too, with that overlay, if this my child's in that kind of that higher dysregulated state right now. Um, you know, does that change the way that I can interact with them in that moment? 
right? If I'm becoming quite, quite, quite dysregulated, maybe a little bit aggressive acting from that kind of fight or flight space, um, that also tells me that it's going to be just that much more confusing for that child to tap into their body cues to make sense of why they're feeling that way, right? We can make the most meaning kind of um, when we are feeling regulated, of course, right? We have the highest capacities in that space when we're feeling really calm and regulated. Um, and there's this really, I find it just fascinating, but as the body becomes more dysregulated, um, you know, as fine-tuned as a machine that it is, the more dysregulated we are, the more muddled the message becomes almost, right? When I'm very dysregulated, I might not have any awareness that my bladder's full anymore. That sensation is gone. It's dropped away entirely. Um, you know, when the brain neurologically kind of says, well, I guess if, if that message isn't being received, it's been firing, it's been firing, it drops off and we stop paying attention to it. So I no longer even feel like I need to pee that badly anymore or poop that badly or need to eat that badly. I just know that something's not okay, right? And people coming close to me, that's a threat. Maybe I'm going to go at you. Um, I need my huge, big personal space. Um, so regulation really is kind of, you know, a really, really key component for successful toilet training, I think. And, um, you know, as a whole, that check in with if I'm noticing your child is becoming increasingly dysregulated and it doesn't seem like anything in the external environment has changed necessarily. There's no new demand or we're not in a new space. We haven't thrown any curveballs. It's kind of that, that prompt, can I go back to those primary regulators and kind of check that off the list right now? Um, and us as the adults will be able to see that a little bit easier, right? Oh, it has been a really long time since we've eaten. Let's try that and see see where that lands. You know what, I guess actually, right, it, it's way past the usual nap time, um, but pooping and peeing can fall in the exact same category. And, you know, for children that are maybe nonverbal or really young children, um, they might have really strong kind of withholding capacities, right, to hold their bladder or their bowels. Um, and so this can go on for quite a long time, even if they don't have the communication capacity to let us know this is happening for me right now. So we kind of need to go through that checklist and support that regulation piece of, let, let's see, let's see how that feels. Thank you for listening to Affect Autism. We'll be back with this week's podcast in just a minute. We Chose Play is a new series documenting my family's floor time journey. You can see the preview on YouTube and you can register to watch the extended trailer for free at affectautism.com play or just go to wechoseplay.com. With each episode, you'll glean insights, tips, and reflections, what I learned and what I know now that I would tell myself back then along the way. I hope it will support caregivers in their floor time experience. We chose play. We have joy every day. And now, let's get back to our podcast. So I've, I've heard a number of parents say that their child will absolutely not go to the bathroom during the day. Mm -hmm. They'll only go at home. So they'll hold it the whole day at school. Is there any way to help uh, them feel more comfortable going at school or is that okay that they hold it all day? Yeah. That, that infuriating answer of it depends. It could <laughs> be, it couldn't, couldn't be. Um, I mean, it's, our bodies are, we run on a schedule. And so it's, it's very, very common, right? For adults not to want to poop at the workplace. It way rather go at home. Um, going to the bathroom, especially <laughs> pooping, can be really slow. And so that can feel a little bit embarrassing if I'm at school that I need to go for a long time. Um, you know, and so getting in those kinds of routines, it, it, it might not necessarily mean that there's a problem happening there. In some cases, that's the child letting us know there's something about school that doesn't feel, feel quite right for me to go poop there. Um, and my body's built a schedule where I can routinely void in the morning after breakfast and every day before I go to bed with mom and dad. And that's, if that is consistently happening and we're in that consistent routine um, and there's no external pain happening maybe from a buildup that that child is withholding at school, um, you know, it, it might not be a problem necessarily. Um, but where it would become something that would kind of pique my spidey senses and say, this is something we should focus on a little bit is if it's, 
if there is an element of kind of of, of big distress, no, I, I never want to go in a bathroom anywhere but my house. That can be really challenging because we're not at home all the time. Um, you know, and that's, we kind of need to become those detectives a little bit to try to make sense of what is it about my home bathroom that is so comfortable? And what about these public bathrooms at school, at a restaurant, at a friend's house even, that just isn't that comfortable, right? Um, and that's going to be really different for everybody, right? Some children have really, really um, are very sensitive to the sounds that happen in bathrooms. There's a lot of sounds, the flushing, the sound of their own urine passing into the toilet, the kids chatting in the stall next to them, the hair drivers, that can be hugely overwhelming. But when I go at home, I can go in the dark with the door closed. The toilet does not need to flush when I'm anywhere near it. I can wash my hands with a washcloth with my mom downstairs and I've removed all of those pieces. Um, and so that's something we need to work through kind of together, right, and try to make sense of how can we experience feelings of safety and regulation in other bathrooms. Um, and usually that work needs to start when we don't need to go to the bathroom. But how often do we go into a bathroom when we don't need to go, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so on that topic, um, what about different methods that suggest bringing your, and this is for little ones when they're first starting to toilet train, bringing your child to the bathroom every half hour and just sitting them on the toilet, whether they have to go or not, uh, or every hour or whatever it is. That That's one of the methods that I heard. Yeah. And, and maybe your child, like I think maybe my son didn't necessarily know when he had to go, so we just bring him and then he maybe would go, maybe wouldn't. Um, just so that he knows until he develops that sense himself. And then that gets into the topic of what you just alluded to, which I've heard other people say is you don't want the bathroom to be the scary place. You want it to be a comfortable place. So maybe we play near the bathtub with toys when no one has to go to the bathroom so that the bathroom is a safe place and they feel okay being in there. Yeah, absolutely. We just, we want to try to find that magic moment. And so our likelihood of um, having, quote unquote, a successful pee, a pee in the toilet, um, the more time we spend sitting on the toilet, the chances of that happening go up. Um, and sometimes that's where it needs to start or it feels like it needs to start there just to have that moment of success, right? And give that opportunity of, right, this is, this is what we're going for right now. Um, you know, and from that, I guess, what can often be really, really helpful is, again, a different strategy around that is spending some time first to try to get to know our child's rhythms and patterns so that um, we can plan some of those trips to the bathroom, in and around the bathroom, in those intervals when it's most likely that our child is going to need to use the washroom. Um, and this is the great part, right, about our bodies, that they are regular. <laughs> that um, oftentimes if we're, we've eaten a meal, um, very commonly afterwards, we're gonna need to void one way or another, right? You have a big drink of that water bottle, like clockwork, It'd be different though for everybody's bodies. Some kids need to go really quite a way, quite quick afterwards. Um, sometimes it's that magic kind of 45 minute window, maybe it's two hours from that time. Um, but if we can spend some time kind of watching really carefully for what those cues might be. Um, children do tend, they'll strike a little pose, might be subtle. And there's that little bit of a pause or they might lean on something or many children like to go and kind of sit in a little spot in the corner um, or go into the room. When we watch for that, that gives us clues around when is gonna be kind of the most um, likely chance for us to need to go to the bathroom. And then it makes more sense, right, for us to be playing in and around the bathroom or close to the toilet because, hey, right, it's, it's likely that we're going to need to use the washroom. Absolutely. Um, that does take some time to do that. And these cues can be really subtle. And I hear from a lot of parents, well, like, it just looks different. It just looks different all the time. There's nothing consistent about it. Um, sometimes it's this, sometimes it's that. It's hard to say. Um, you know, and I, and I don't disagree necessarily. Um, 
it's just that cue for us to kind of really try to hone in for ourselves is trying to be that detective and to be playful and curious, right? I, I noticed that the child just, oh, they just seem to have a little bit of a pause there. They stopped and their legs are a little bit further apart than they often are standing. Well, I know I haven't changed a diaper in a while and that might be my moment of curiosity. Oh, it looked like you might have peed, right? Can I check? Can I check? And we start with that kind of language um, as a way to help us make sense of, right, that was a really good read of that cue or, oh, my mistake. No, you must have been looking at something across the room. I wonder if you were looking at those monkey bars. Let's go try those. Um, this really kind of natural floor time kind of language where we're narrating, we're, we're emphasizing it, communicating kind of why we're doing what we're doing, all with the goal of building meaning and that meaning making piece. Um, and if I do see that, oh, oh, you are wet, then that's great because now I can say, oh, it's time to get changed. Let's go. Um, and I've shortened that interval from, right, peeing wet diaper for any amount of time to suddenly, hey, wow, great, when I pee, now I'm having that link. This is when mom wants to take me to the bathroom. Um, and it's a great way to start building that kind of body connection. When this happens, when I feel this, I might not have words to necessarily describe it, but there will be some, some sort of awareness there. This is what happens next. And oh, hey, that's when mom says, oh, doesn't that feel good? Or we do the silly dance or, or, or. Right, right. And it becomes this really beautiful sequence of events. Um, you know, so I really, you know, I encourage parents to, you know, to be curious about that and follow through with that and be okay with like, oh, I was wrong. You didn't, you didn't go, huh? So what were you looking at there? Why did you stop? Let's try to make sense of that. We've got a new learning opportunity. There's nothing lost. Um, yeah. but if I happen to be successful, fantastic. Um, so let's go now to the extreme where the child is terrified of being in the bathroom and you already mentioned a bunch of the overwhelming sensory experiences like the hand dryer blowing the like noise and echo of the walls if you're in a shopping mall uh bathroom for instance and um just children who in general just scream if you bring them anywhere near the washroom i i want to just say first that rule out that it's not because you've done behavioral strategies with them and traumatized they're now traumatized because they're being um you know trained to do something that they can't do and they feel you know overwhelmed and so now they're scared to go in the bathroom that bar, you know that aside if they still are you know you haven't done that but they're still just overwhelmed and screaming how do you help kids and i, I imagine Maybe you're going to say what I suggested earlier, which is like, just get them used to being in the room when they're in a good mood. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, and we do, we always want to rule out what you had touched on. Um, you know, many, many children, um, neurotypicals as well, um, their diet, and many kids are pretty picky eaters. Um, have a really strong relationship, right, with our digestion and our bowels. And so constipation is something, um, you know, that, that I see time and time again that I know parents and children really struggle with. And that um, is really important that we try to look into that kind of before going too far down the toileting wormhole. Because if we do have a long-standing history of chronic constipation, um, right, likely what that's going to mean is diminished sensory awareness, as the bowel stretches and is holding that poop for long, long periods of time, um, there actually isn't going to be those internal body signals anymore that say you need to go. We, we lose them. It's like you become acclimatized to them. So if we know there's that long-standing history of constipation, um, that does conflict kind of with this ultimate goal of being able to support the child to link, hey, when my body feels like this, it's time to go. They unfortunately don't have that, that access to that sensation. Um, and then building on that, I guess the sensations that they do have can be extremely uncomfortable. Constipation and to pass um, stool at that point can be quite painful. Um, and it can also be sometimes actually really quite distressing for children if they've been um, prescribed a laxative by, a, from, right, by their physician to suddenly have diarrhea. That's really unpredictable. 
um, and this thing that they, they haven't experienced that much. And mom and dad respond to with like, whoa, whoa, gross, what just happened here? You know, unfortunately that moment too can, can build on to that kind of that anxiety um, overlay of what toileting can be. And so um, important for us to look into that and to kind of start there and make sure, right, if we're gonna focus on toileting and we're really focusing on, right, if we're talking about poop and bowel movements, um, is our child able to regularly pass their stool? Is that already happening in their pull-ups? Um, and that's one of those key pieces I would say that we want to make sure is, is there before thinking about going into sitting into the toilet and trying to be there and trying to push in different things um, to kind of check that one off the list, right? And that relationship between constipation and dysregulation is huge as well. So starting with that piece. Um, so just ruling out medical issues, ruling out pain, um, and of course, we may never know for sure, especially if they're younger and non-speaking, but, yeah. um, but at least, you know, having an idea, like you said, if, if they're pooping regularly in their diaper, um, then that's a good sign that they're not constipated. So at least you rule that out, but then they still are terrified to go in the bathroom. Then maybe it's more other sensory issues. Yeah, absolutely could be. And going slow is, you know, that's how we're going to get there. I think that comes from Maud LaRue saying we go, we slow down to go faster, right, to speed up. Um, and in that moment, it's kind of, okay, I really want to respect and empathize with my child that that space is distressing. Um, and so do I want to just drop them into the deep end and say, we have to be inside this bathroom right now? Um, I do know some parents that have gone there and that's been really a helpful thing to say we just needed to rip that band-aid off Alicia we just needed to be in there rip it off my kid actually had success so we made it through uh, maybe sometimes that might work for some of our children um, you know but other times it's it's going to be really helpful for us to just start with that co-regulation piece Oof, that's a scary space oh boy well, you know, we don't, we don't need to hang out in there necessarily, right? And we might just start by getting um, kind of comfortable hanging out closer to the bathroom, or um, maybe it's a kind of a shift that we as a family decide that we're going to start for a little while using the washroom with the door open within the privacy of our family unit um, as a way for the child to kind of just start to kind of peek out the corner of their eye and listen. We know our kids are always watching and listening, right, to kind of give them that model of, this is something we do. This is something we all do. We all do it all the time. And they can see when mom and dad and siblings walk out of that washroom and say, ah, that felt better, right? Um, maybe we practice doing that and, and we don't flush the toilet purposefully when the child is right there and we even need to model, okay, okay, you know, Stella, you bring your brother to the kitchen and you guys plug your ears because I'm going to flush right now. Um, and it, it comes from us initiating that moment to let our child know, we see you, we see that this is really, really hard, but I'm not going to try to pair it with that moment also of you needing to be there and you needing to press that handle and you also needing to have used the toilet yourself, um, right? We want to start that kind of that journey of just that connection piece. Um, and then we can kind of have an option I often find to start problem solving together. Um, but if we start with regulation and kind of that emotional respect and empathetic approach that will open some of the doors for problem solving. And we start seeing our children, right, maybe always going to that bathroom and making sure that light is turned off because there's a fan on. That's like what we have at our clinic. When the light goes on, the fan is on, and that might be too loud for a lot of our kids. And so it can be really helpful for them to know anytime we walk past that bathroom, um, myself included, I'll say, oh, oh, that light's on, oh, that annoying fan, and I just turn it off and keep on walking. Trying to weave it in, but letting them know, right, that doesn't need to be on. There's no pressure for that to be on and for that to be this nagging stimuli that is just not okay for you to be around. Let's try to go through that process kind of together. Until next time, here's to choosing play and experiencing joy every day. If you're a caregiver looking to implement your own floor time approach, please see the parents menu at icdl.com.
the Interdisciplinary Council on Development and Learning for the virtual floor time consultations for parents. There you can schedule an appointment, look at the virtual DIR home program services, and see the weekly parent support meetings registration. We aim to help you implement the developmental individual differences relationship-based model at home, taking into account where your child is developmentally and their individual sensory processing differences within your safe and nurturing relationship to promote and support their developmental potential.